thanks everyone for coming. This will get started if anyone else is still eating or not. Probably be some late stragglers. So we've done a couple of dozen of these at this point now. So really great to see a whole bunch of new faces in the Mesos community. Um, we have a really great speaker tonight. Uh, folks have not been involved or aware of like all the work that's been going into Mesos networking. You're about to get a, a lot of great information. It's been a little over a year that a lot of folks have been working on this and it's awesome. It works and Chris is going to really get into some good details about it. And if you're interested in networking stuff in general, Chris is definitely the person to speak to uh, overall. So um, really looking forward to this. Uh, before we start, I want to thank uh, Yodel for hosting this meetup. And John's going to say a couple words. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Um, hi, everyone. I'm John. I'm, I'm with Yodel, as are all of these blue shirts sort of hovering in the back here. Uh, they were waiting for everyone to get their first crack at pizza, and then they're like, free pizza. Um, so we're really excited to host the Mesos Meetup. We're using Mesos in production here. It is our, our main production, sort of uh, the, the, the base layer of the PaaS infrastructure. We run Marathon and Docker on top. We've termed it MDMA. You can draw your own conclusions. It is ecstatic. Um, but I just wanted to, to thank Chris for coming, uh, thank Joe for the opportunity to host. I have to put the obligatory. We're running Mesos. We're hiring actively for developers, for systems engineers, um, for, for almost every technical role. So if anyone's interested, chat with me or somebody else in a blue shirt um, or, or check out our, our website. We, we would love to have more technical people here. Um, and with that, I will hand it over. So Chris, thank you. All right, everyone. Well, uh, thanks for uh, coming out this evening. Uh, a little wet, but uh, hopefully this will be interesting. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about networking in Mesos and some of the um, concepts <coughs> that we're starting to see in Mesos networking and how we implement those, at least within Project Calico. So I'll start with the more general, then I'll talk about some more, more specifics. I don't mind these being interactive, so feel free to ask questions. If you ask a good question, I will throw a stuffed cat at you. If you point out the at least one intentional error in the slides, I will also throw a cat at you. So there's at least one intentional error in here, so if you can spot it, the cat is yours. It also proves you've got good Mesos foo if you do spot it. So, uh, you know, why Project Calico? The internet's about cats. Uh, so therefore, we had to have a cute logo. So that's their Calico cat. Um, we're going to talk about networking and the integration of networking and security or policy enforcement. Uh, micro-segmentation. How do you do micro-segmentation in a container environment or in a Mesos environment in a sane, scalable way? Um, and we're going to talk about this by you know, saying that the way you achieve this is by giving every container its own IP address. Container every pot. Uh, uh, con uh, no, I'm not FDR, so uh, uh, IP for every container and more. So and let me go back a little bit. Project Calico, just as a, a, so you know a little bit about us and what we're doing. We're an open source networking stack. We support Mesos, Kubernetes, Docker, OpenStack, various other things. So it's basically an open, stack, open source project that provides networking in these kind of scale out environments. My background, uh, I'm the architect with Calico and I've run big networks before uh, operationally and and cloud infrastructures. So I sort of come from an operational background. Now, what's the, the major or one of the major challenges for cloud? Uh, yeah. uh, that is annoyingly right in my window here. So uh, the issue is the containers, we've built infrastructures, uh, we've built even basic virtualized infrastructures based the way we've always built enterprises. So small numbers of apps, vertically integrated, very simple north-south flows, fairly static environments. The cloud environment, what we're doing in Mesos and other things, dramatically changes that. So instead of having applications or servers that now last in a rack for years, running in a single application, talking to a thing above them, thing below them, we now have potentially thousands of containers or hundreds of thousands of containers, many of which need to talk to a lot of things, east-west as well as north-south, and they may only last for seconds or minutes, might last longer or not. So these things that 
sort of had issues even at very low scale and very low churn. As we go into this environment, we have orders of magnitude more churn in scale and things start breaking down. And if you take a look at the number of uh, events we have had in our industry lately uh, where net things have happened that weren't intentional, uh, almost all of these are because somewhere something got into the infrastructure and then someone that that bad actor was able to hop, skip, and jump all over the infrastructure and basically end up owning the infrastructure. And there are exactly two types of enterprises in the world today, those who know they have an advanced persistent threat in their infrastructure and those who don't know it yet. And there's probably very few people that don't fit in one of those two camps. So we have to assume in these kind of worlds that your infrastructure is not completely trusted that there is going to be, as we start deploying these things, you're pulling source from lots of other places, deploying it very dynamically. You have to assume that not everything is always going to be clean. And it may not even be an intentional bad actor. It might be bad code that somebody wrote. But you know, the, you know there have been a lot of bad, big incidences, and, and there are going to be more. You know, so. How did we get to this? Why do we have that? It's because we still practice security like the Middle Ages, literally. So you build a wall around a city. That's your external firewall. And you have stuff inside that, that wall. And then you build a wall around the castle. That's your second firewall in between the, the web tier and the app tier. And then you have the dungeon tower that is what protects the, the keys to the kingdom, which is your database. So you basically have this stage set of walls you go through. That's basically exactly the model that people still try to deploy today. Staged firewalls, vertical, everything within a given firewall is trusted because nothing could ever get through this, this great firewall I have and it's always kept up to date. How many people here I'm sure everyone here is much cleaner than the networks I've worked in before. Everyone here's firewall rules are completely current. And you don't have any old cruft in there. And somebody goes, you know, I don't think we use that rule anymore, but we better not remove it because we might break something. Is that ever a conversation anyone has ever had with their security folks? Yes, and it's a conversation you probably all have had with your security folks. Yeah, so there is a problem with that model. Hard, crunchy outside, soft, chewy center. Once you get past that, and you will get people past that, there's very little to stop people once they're within that wall from going wherever they want to go. Am I saying anything that annoys anyone yet? Anyone here who sells firewalls and legacy firewall appliances and they're getting really upset with what I'm saying? Darn. So now we get to a model, so okay. I had servers. In fact, I'll tell a little story. I won't mention which company it was. I was actually in talking to a, a reasonably sized enterprise doing web scale stuff, and their intent was the first two servers in every rack were the DMZ servers. So any workload need to talk to the outside world would be scheduled on one of the top two servers, and then there was a firewall in slot three, and then the back end infrastructure below it on each rack, and they viewed that that was a fungible infrastructure. I mean, this, you know, applications would get deployed on the top part of the rack or the bottom part of the rack. It was a unique model, but you know, that was an attempt to try and deal with this, where we have lots of, of fungible resources. We want to schedule in a very dynamic manner, make most use of resources, but still build physical walls. Well, they did it by separating these into separate hardware pools. It's one way of doing it. I don't know if it's going to get you the scale you want. So how do I build this infrastructure on top of that block of walls? Well, you can take their case, and, and some number of servers are one type, and some number of servers are another type. OK, so you've now beaten the system to sort of still keep that three-tier architecture going. But now you know, there's lots of different application servers and lots of different web servers lots of databases or other processes, and they keep multiplying. You know, I'm sure, again, you don't have a, oh, where are you going to use MongoDB? And some developer comes along and says, you know, Cassandra is a really better tool for this here, for this one application. So you start getting 
at these different tiers, oh, it, it's not a static thing. You know, more and more stuff starts populating. And every time you do this in this model, you're opening a ticket to get your firewall rules updated. Or you need to add another Cassandra node and you need to update your firewall tickets. And of course, everyone's firewall teams update those tickets in seconds after you submit their, the, the security changes, right? Everyone's, everyone's ticket responses are almost instantaneous, right? No? It's disappointing. And it keeps propagating. And propagating. And propagating. Why is it doing that? It's because of this thing that you guys all like so much. You know, schedule tasks, put them in there, let them scale up, scale down, start up, you know, start up containers or processes based on load and demand. Uh, everything is fungible. And that's what leads to what we just saw. This is what completely breaks the model we've been talking about. Because the only way you're going to get hardware-based isolation is to actually have Mesos treat each thing differently, have separate clusters, separate pools. How do you do that, especially when it's just not north-south anymore, right? So in that previous model, the application that was talking for a while to Mongo all of a sudden now needs to get a bit of data out of Cassandra. So now I need to update those firewall rules again to allow it to talk to the other data store or some other interesting bit of data is. So why don't we just tear down the walls, let everyone live happily ever after, and just stick a big firewall in the front of it and say everything's trusted behind that firewall. Again, hard, crunchy outside, soft, chewy inside. This also is probably not a good security model. So um, the idea is we have a bunch of components. As components sit in the infrastructure, and placed wherever they want to be. The problem is if that's that model, firewall on the outside, everything's trusted on the inside, you get a black hat process pops up somewhere and it can propagate and hop all over the network. Looks like my animation is broken. Applications need to be talked to other components in your infrastructure. So I need that connectivity. Now I could build walls around each of these components. So each of these components, I could isolate and treat as independent entities, provide some policy control, but I still need to allow them to talk to one another. That orange container still needs to talk to the blue and yellow container that I showed earlier. So I have to have a way of dynamically adjusting these partitions such that orange can talk to blue and yellow, but the bad actor down here that you saw earlier can't talk to anything else. So this is what we start talking about fine-grained isolation in, in container worlds. So the idea being that each workload uh, has a policy associated with it, and that policy defines who you can talk to, who you can't talk to. We'll, I'll give a, an example of this in a little bit, but now I'm going to talk a little bit about one way of doing this. Hold on a second. So, hold on a second. Sorry. Make sure I've got the. Sorry. So, oh, that's interesting. Sharing stopped. And we're back. Sorry about that. Okay. So. One way of doing this is to basically stick a firewall that's policy driven in front of each and every container in your infrastructure. So this is what Calico does. Basically every container is connected into the server which routes its traffic and we enforce a firewall in front of each and every container and that firewall rule is, is driven by policy. So this is the basic Calico model, uh, we'll go into a little more details. Um, so before I go any further, um, the other thing that makes this work, by the way, is we assign every container an IP address. So every container is a unique entity on the network. This allows us to treat it like a unique entity on the network, route it, policy control it. 
et cetera. This is some, a lot of the work that's gone into Mesos and net modules, et cetera, is the ability to have richer networking experience programmed into Mesos rather than just port mapping. Basically, the ability to assign addresses, treat containers as first class citizens on the network rather than a process on a server. Before I go any further, yes. Correct. So I'll give an example in just a little bit, but one of the issues with, in fact, we have a, a demo that shows one of the issues with port mapping. If my applications all try and bind, bind to the same port, you know, I've got multiple applications, they all end up on the same server, they're all trying to port bind port 9000. One of them is going to win, the others are going to lose, and they're gonna to have to get their ports rewritten to something else, which makes a service discovery issue. Two, my policies that I want to apply in the network now can't be mapped to a specific process, because I have no idea what that process is. He's been port mapped somewhere in the infrastructure. I've lost the visibility of the two things talking on the network to one another. So we'll get, uh, hold on for a little bit, take a look at the rest of the demo, and we'll come back to your question if I haven't answered it. Another one here. Correct. Cor but actually, proxy is not required for that, right? Proxy is not required for that. The container can go everywhere. It can take its address wherever it goes in this model, right? So the idea is. The minute I stick a proxy in front of something, that proxy has to be, aware, as was just stated, a couple of things. The proxy now has to be aware of that application. Whenever I update the application, I have to update the proxy to match that application. I also have to update all the clients out in the field to do that. If now, if this is, you know, it, you, if it's all web stuff, eh, maybe that works. A lot of people do things that aren't basic web stuff. So my client now needs to be service discovery aware. I have to have a proxy that does that. And the application also needs to be aware of this being potentially port mapped. Versus, so yes, you can make that work. The more and more complex your things become, the more and more complex that becomes. The whole idea about doing containers and everything else was, the last time I checked, to make this easy to deploy and create and deploy applications. Throwing a whole bunch of stuff in front of it that needs to be updated at the same time to deal with networking stuff sort of goes in opposition to that. Whereas if I can just simply say, like IP was originally designed, everything has an IP address, all of those requirements fall by the wayside. I no longer need a proxy in front of these things. You put one in front of it if you want, but you don't need it. I've removed the number of components you need for this thing to be able to talk. So, a little bit different here in that, first of all, the blast radius is now contained to a single container. Yeah, so there's no way, if you, there is no way to assume, sorry, go ahead. It is, it is still a firewall rule. The interesting thing about this firewall rule is it's a tied to policy rather than IP addresses. This thing moves as policy adapts with it. There's no way I can completely protect all of this. Well, there is exactly one way I can protect this entire infrastructure and not have anything ever get popped in it. It's called a pair of cable dikes. 
and I go to the cable in front of the data center and I go clip and and uh, not really the the thing here if I build a big domain firewall in front big domain I get in to any one of those points I potentially have free reign across all of them because there's no policy control once you get beyond that in this case to get between 1.2 and 1.5 I have to go through at least two policy control points. If you even if you pop 1.2's policy control point, 1.5 will protect 1.2 from talking to 1.5. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. The two are not, the two are complementary. I can definitely do something to clean, you know, the system from an API server is, uh, we've done this in SNMP land for a long time, SNMP proxies that die on the behalf of saving the SNMP server, SMTP server. So we've done this for a while in the industry. So you can do that. Now you still have the problem of the thing that does the cleansing might get popped, but that's not the only thing. The attacks coming in through the front door is one thing. Um, the guy that happened to build 192.168.1.7, before he built it, he picked up a USB key he found lying at the door to your company, plugged it in to see what was on it, and now 192.168.1.7 has an interesting little gift that you didn't intend. Your cleansing does nothing to protect that against that. So that's possible. Um, they take a look. There are some folks that are, are doing cryptographic signatures and traceable trust all the way up. That still does not solve your problem. Uh, so you still have to assume that 1.7 might be compromised at some point in time. And if you haven't built the additional stuff around it, once that happens, it's the soft chewy center problem again. Go ahead. Not necessarily. So I'm encrypting an untrusted source. I'm encrypting an evil actor. Actually, so encryption helps, but encryption doesn't actually solve, serve, save you from this problem. Because I am in 1.7, which means I'm on the other side of that TLS encryption, and I have access to those TLS keys. So I now sign and say, this is a trusted packet, because I had the key. And I send now this bad actor to the other side, and the other side's going to trust it because it was signed with the right key. Because that key was on 1.7. The key, the encryption's not going to protect you from that, though. So encryption is only going to enclose the data and say it came from someone who held this key. It does nothing to, to say that that key was not compromised. Right? So the, we, we, you know, there's a, remember, remember, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean that everyone's not out to get me. So, um, so let's look at a little bit about how this might work. So in a Calico model, I've got a couple of servers, and I've got a key value store that basically holds the state of the network. What should be able to talk to what? So I've decided I'm going to create three different containers, container A, B, and C. And I'm going to attach some profiles to those containers. So container A is going to have two profiles. It's a load balancer, and it, it's uh, in the QA stack. Container B and C are web apps. 
The load balancing profile says it allows traffic on port 80 to things that are web apps. However many web apps there are, doesn't matter. The web app profile says that it's going to allow traffic from port 80 from anything from a load, that's, called, that's a load balancer in the infrastructure. The QA policy says I'm going to allow traffic inbound on port 443 from a block of addresses that's the QA robots somewhere else in your, in your organization. And pub says it's going to allow 443 from anywhere in the world. So those are the security profiles you've defined, and you've attached those profiles to some workloads. So what happens? When workload A shows up, so Mesos launches this, launches workload A, an agent that sits on the compute server looks in the key value store and says, I just got workload A. What's its profiles? And finds out those profiles are load balancer and QA. So it then goes back and says, okay, well, are there any load balancers? I mean, there's no load balancers in the system now, so it doesn't do anything with that policy because there's nothing to do. But it does say and then no allow traffic inbound from QA robots. So now workload A can be talked to on port 443 from QA robots and everything else is denied. Workload B shows up and it's a web app. So Felix goes and says, workload B, what, what is it? Oh, it's a web app. He goes and says, well, web apps, I need to allow traffic from load balancers. Are there any load balancers? Yeah. DB8 colon colon one. So on workload B, I allow traffic on port 80 from DB8 colon colon one. Similarly, I now have a, a web app, so I update the rules on work for workload A that allow it to talk to a web app, talk to DB8 colon colon two. Same thing happens when workload C shows up. It's allowed to talk, to receive traffic from A, and A is allowed to send traffic to C. So the interesting thing to note here is just because A wants to send traffic to C, and the rules allow that, unless C allows the traffic from A, the traffic can't get there. So as workloads come and go, these rules are all updated dynamically. When the workload goes away, its rules go away. Now it's all working. You decide that you're going to want to promote this from QA to pub, to, pub, to uh, prod. So you simply change the label on workload A to pub. And when you do that, Felix notes that the security policy for A has changed, updates its rules to instead of allowing 443 from QA, it now allows 443 from anywhere in the world. And this is now a published service. Oops, didn't work. You just go back and you flip this rule back and say it's back in QA and it stops being able to talk, talk from the outside world. The idea being here that wherever these workloads go, I only render the rules that are necessary to protect that workload where it is, and it's dynamic. So even if A gets popped, it can't do anything with B or C. I'm sorry. Yes? So the updates, so Felix is ephemeral. It's getting data from uh, etcd, in our case, is the key value store. etcd is a consent raft based algorithm. So long as you have a quorum, it's going to keep running. If etcd completely fails and restarts, the traffic that was allowed in the network when it failed is still going. You just can't change policies or update new work certain workloads until the couple seconds it takes for for etcd to come back. There is no central controller here. This is one way to get to scale. Each server does these calculations by itself and only for its own workloads. So it's a Venn diagram. They're, both sides have to agree to communicate. This is a way of doing a dynamic policy. And since no one has noticed, you all lost the chance to get a cat. Mesos doesn't support v6 yet, guys. So come on, I was expecting somebody, somebody should have caught that one.
<laughs> Come up. So this is all IP tables. So these are all IP tables rules. They're installed on the trusted zone. So in the root namespace, in the, the root container, the, the root network namespace that is connects to each of the workloads, each of the containers. We've tested this. We haven't found a scaling problem with the rules yet. Um, we have tested up to 16 million matches in a rule, and it's an order one match. So performance does not get impacted up to 16. That's where some of the fun sauce is, is how to build those rules so they're efficient. Um, we've, we've invested some amount of time in doing that. Um, but so that's not so much of an issue. We can do this today in container world. Uh, we've tested up to 1,000 physical servers, 100,000 containers. Containers spinning up at 150 containers a second. And the system works. And at that rate, 99% of the packet, 99% of the containers have a time to first ping of 10 milliseconds or less. So that's propagating the routes, installing the policies on both sides, and everything. For 99% of those 100,000 containers, it happens in less than 10 milliseconds. Yeah? It's, it's up to you. So basically, their IP addresses, what pool or pools you decide you want to give to Calico. It is certainly possible to say, I'm going to have two pools. I'm going to have a set of addresses in 10 slash 8 inside the data center, but some of my workloads I want to expose to the outside world, so I give them, I have a public address pool too, and you basically tell Calico when you tell through Mesos or Kubernetes or whatever, we're not Mesos here, we want that workload to be publicly addressed or privately addressed. Yes? So when a Calico mode fails, so let's say the server hosting workload A and workload B just blew up, caught fire, smoking ruin. A couple things are going to happen. Um, Mesos is going to figure that out and launch A and B somewhere else. At the same time, that's not, I don't have to do anything, right? Mesos does that or should do that. But Mesos will respin those up. Felix is no longer there. Those routes are no longer advertised. When Meso says, you know, workloads A and B are gone, that gets updated into etcd. And in this case, the server hosting workload C will remove the rule allowing traffic from 2001 DB8 colon colon 1 because it doesn't exist anymore. And when another one spins up and it's DB8 colon colon 54, that rule will get updated with 54. And now my load balancer is back. It's somewhere else. The, the key thing is, this is an interesting point. You have to assume that this is a dynamic world with a high rate of churn. By doing this, the policies are only rendered for what's existing in the network. If that happened and you had to spin up somewhere else and the firewall rules you know, didn't encompass the load balancer being on another server because it's on a different subnet, gee, you spun it up and you know, server still isn't working. Well, why isn't it? Well, I have to open a firewall ticket. In this case, the infrastructure handles that because it's tied to the behavior of the infrastructure itself. Yes? So basically, when the addresses are no longer used, when they get pulled, pulled off, when that workload goes away, that's recorded in that CD. So I then return that address to the pool in IPAM. So IPAM is nothing more than another structure within that CD, the address assignments. Mesos Network, Network Isolator tells us the workload has gone away. And then we do the appropriate cleanup within Calico. So, go ahead. Right. So, we'll, we'll talk about that. Any other questions? I owe some cats to folks, so... 
One, I'm trying to remember everyone that asked good questions. So who wants a cat that asked a question, if I recognize you? There you go. Next. Who else? I haven't been doing this. Okay, they're over there. We've got more cats over here. We got the cat gun over there. Uh, I got one more before we have to resort to back up over there. Okay. There we go. Meow. Um, okay. So there was another issue. So we just talked about security, and this is how we secure things. There is another issue, which is Mesos HA proxy, and this is the problem you mentioned earlier. Both those services want to bind to port 80. They both advertise port 80. Their poor client doesn't know how to do S doesn't know how to do SVR records, SRV records. Well, that won't work. You can't do that. So actually, the other application gets screwed and has to bind to port 8080 and figure out some way of telling its clients to bind to port 8080 instead. Because I only have one IP address out of here. So this is a problem, basic, simple. This is, this is a problem not just in proxies, whenever you do NAT and whenever you do PAT. That's why most people don't try and put services behind port translators because you will end up with these kind of issues. Also, it wreaks all sorts of fun with things that are tied to IP addresses, applications that are actually tied to IP addresses and ports because now their identity changes. So we have a solution for this. You just saw it. Mesos and Project Calico. We make all the world better. So uh, we'll talk about a little bit about now how we do this in uh, reality. The Mesos master writes, we listen to the Mesos master for data about what workloads are out there? When a workload is being created, does it have an address? Does it need an address? If so, we assign that address. And what its security policies are, what net groups it's in, et cetera. Those all get fed down to that Felix agent on each server. And that Felix agent programs the Linux kernel and the IP tables rules. So it programs IP routing in the Linux kernel and IP tables rules in the Linux kernel. There is no bridging. There is no switching. There is no OVS. Basically, all of your interfaces connect directly into the Linux kernel and their L3 interfaces. Workloads, two workloads on the same server, try and ping one another, you're going to see a router hop in between, which is the server. So all routed all the time. If we need to establish routing beyond the server, which is in most cases, we talk standard routing protocols out to your top of rack switches, your spine switches, so the entire infrastructure knows where every container is at any point in time. We use BGP as a general rule. Um, it's scalable. It's, it runs this thing called the internet, which I think is probably bigger than any of our clouds. Some people may not think not, but it probably is, so we know this sort of works at scale. If you're in a public cloud, we'll talk APIs directly to the, uh, to the layer, um, you know, to, to the, the various API front ends for the different uh, cloud, public clouds. Some of that work is still ongoing. Some of that API work is still ongoing. And let's talk about net modules workflow. So we have an isolator module on the agent. We have the master, uh, the framework, and the, the Calico plugins. So when you launch a task from the framework, uh, we send net info to the master. The master does a, a launch task with the net info to the agent isolator module. The agent isolator module then goes and gets an IP address from the Calico IPAM, returns that back to the isolator module, and then the isolator module calls isolate with the IP that it just got and the policy that came out of the framework to the network virtualizer. So that's basically how Calico, and that is what talks to Felix, and Felix goes ahead and, and instruments the infrastructure, uh, the actual Linux kernel appropriately. Hmm? The routes are summarizable, especially in containers. In OpenStack, we're not quite there yet, but 
It's because the OpenStack IPAM that exists today doesn't summar doesn't allow summarization. It's going to, so we're going to fix it so it does. But in open, what happens in container land when a given compute server, when the first time a workload shows up on a given compute server on a given agent, if there's nothing else on it, we will go get a block of addresses out of your pool. And right now it's a slash 26, and we assign it to that server. So long as there's at least one host in that block of addresses on that server, that server will announce the slash 26 out. So now I'm just announcing the next 63 things that show up. I don't have to change any routing announcements. When I go to container 65, I go get another block of 26, another slash 26, another block of 64, put it on that server, and now I'm announcing two slash 26s. If I pick up that workload and move its address somewhere else, we can still announce that. We use this longest prefix match standard IP technology, which allows you to say, you know, this whole block of addresses is over here, except for this one, and it's over here, standard IP behavior. When we do this for 100,000 containers, we see about 280 routes at the top of rack and about 7,000 routes at the spine. So about any switch can handle this today. So that's 1,000 servers, 100,000 containers. And I walk people through the math if they're interested. But So yes, we do summarize. Summarization is a good thing. That's how IP works at scale. Just use it. Excuse me? Our Calico plugin, which is off of the isolator module, yes, implements the isolator. So when that gets called, our Calico plugin actually programs the rules. And then we update the framework, say it's all finished. And there's obviously a cleanup module that's in there. So as things get reaped, the cleanup module gets called. And, and we reap the resources that we've consumed. So I'm going to give a little demonstration. I don't have the demonstration on my laptop. I have been traveling too much. I, I'm sorry, but I have a video of it. And honestly, this is an actual working video. So this isn't hand wavy. This is actually a, a, a screen capture of a video. So the idea is we have a Mesos cluster with two agents. We're going to launch four probe tasks. And those probe tasks all bind to port 9000, and they all try and reach all the other probes. So each probe is going to try and reach all the other probes. We want all these to launch successfully in one, and then we want to isolate them into two groups so that two probes can talk to each other, the other two probes can talk to each other, and they can't talk between the groups. So that's what we're going to show. Demonstration. Yeah. So this is host scheduling and ports. So we're going to launch a cluster. And now we're going to show it on the browsers we launched. There we go. There's Marathon. And then we're going to launch four probes. And you'll notice that all the probes are trying to bind to port 9000. And they require their ports. And you'll notice that two of them didn't launch. Because they've launched on two agents. Each agent only has one port 9000, so two of them failed in their launch. So now what we're going to do instead is we're going to launch another cluster. In this case, we're going to, there we are. And now we're going to launch four probes with IP per container. So this is with Calico installed. So every, every container is getting its own, each probe is getting its own IP address. And what you notice is we don't have to define ports because each container has its own IP address. It can use all the ports it need, wants to. Mesos doesn't have to broker that as a resource. And when we take a look at Marathon, 
they all launched, and there are all the four probes pinging one another. This is actual. This is what the probes generate is this this data. So we have this cute graphic, and A is pinging, able to reach B, C, and D, and vice versa. So everything can ping everything else. Now what we want to do is isolate them. And so we're going to launch the probes that are, and we're going to isolate them. And what you're going to see here in a second is that. Some of them below belong to profile star one, and some belong to profile star two. So everything that's in star one should be able to ping other things in star one. Everything that's in star two should be able to ping star two. And so when we fire it up and look at the probes output, we can see that A is pinging B and C is pinging D. If you went in now and you said B is part of star two instead of star one, then B, C, and D be able to ping each other, and A wouldn't be able to talk to anyone, be all alone. So this is basically Project Calico working in a Mesos environment, IP per container with strong isolation, potentially down to the application or port level. Any questions before I go? Before I continue on, is this is this interesting? Is this are people finding this interesting? Questions? Okay. Yep. At least one thumbs up. Okay. So Mesos would be doing service discovery, right? So yeah, and it basically it gets an IP address. I tell Mesos this is the IP address of the container. Yes. Yeah. How do non-containers communicate with the containers? Non-containers, so things like an Oracle rack or whatever else, has an IP address. It's routed. It goes to that IP address. This is this is the thing. IP basically allows things to communicate. So Calico updates the routers either by making API calls or more usually in private environments by talking BGP to the routers or to the switches, so the routers know where the containers are. No, it talks BGP. It does. So that's part of the configuration when you stand up your infrastructure is the top of rack switch ends up pairing a couple different configurations, but ends up pairing with the compute servers. No, basically standard BGP. So basically you say, okay, this rack, you know, the servers themselves are 10.64, dot one slash twenty six dot zero slash twenty six you go into the Cisco and you say peer with one two three or if you're lucky your switch vendor you just say peer with anything in this subnet when it talks to you so it's basically st straight up BGP peering there's nothing special about it That's what I'm saying. So it's on day zero, and you're standing up your infrastructure. Like you configure your switch today, and you say these ports were on these VLANs. Instead, you say peer with these IP addresses. Or in some cases, just like I have to configure the switch for anything else that I'm doing in the infrastructure, right? There now, open config might be a path to do that in the future. Um, uh, you know, NetConf might be a way of doing that in the future. Some switch vendors actually allow you to say, here's a block of addresses I'll accept a peering connection from. And then you don't really have to configure the per peering. I can use route reflectors instead of direct peering with the switches. All the things I can do with BGP. I No, because just there's too many variables. Yep. Um, we're working with someone on their APIs. I can't talk about who because it's actually development they're doing. And we're uh, pretty much all of them were either implementing by ourselves or with the cloud provider. But uh, stay tuned for further information. The other thing we can do is we can also do a stateless IP and IP tunnel if you need to do that as well. And I can talk about the tunneling later. The idea is we don't normally like to tunnel and keep it as simple as possible, but in some places you have to, and we have a way of doing that statelessly. Your, 
Mm -hmm. No. Neutron is not going to configure your switches or your routers. Huh? Neutron can't even configure itself. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> no, Neutron does not do that. You know, it might be things like Open Daylight that might try and do that, which is a Neutron plugin. But, you know, that's, that's a, you're introducing a whole bunch more interesting technology to do something that is really a fairly basic thing, which is drop five lines of config on a switch. To me, that sounds more like an Ansible chef or puppet problem rather than a SDN controller problem. What, Ansible chef or puppet? There are lots of people who do exactly that. Joe, you had a... Oh, we like your commentary. So I, I was going to say that like, what's really cool about this in part because people in these spaces don't see how awesome it is because they're kind of not seeing how you set up systems in the grid. But with this, like, when you deploy environments, so you're not playing environments, you're playing like 10 different environments. There's one for Joe, there's one for Chris, there's one for QA, there's one for staging, there's one for our customer implementations, all have the same grid. Right? You don't have any isolation between like, all these different environments that are trying to talk together. You know, outside of these sessions, you have humans sort of spinning up their VMs and they're picking servers and like, oh yeah, 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 you're a joke, you got your development servers, that's box six, seven, nine. You know, China's has her development servers and that's box nine, ten, and eleven, whatever. Right? We're never gonna have that kind of issues. You know, in Mesos, that's silly, right? Because like we're all sharing computing resources, and we have no way to isolate ourselves like inside of this big, wonderful supercomputer. That's <laughs> really scary when you do Right. This is like really amazing when you're really doing things at scale inside of this. So I just want to like, you know, convey that to people who are. Excellent. So last pick, last slide, and I'll shut up and take questions and let you get back to beer. Um, so we've been net modules have been supporting Mesos Containerizer since Mesos 26, which supports IP per container. IP address management, DNS-based service discovery, and network isolation. So basically, it's there. There's the Git repo for pulling it down. And that includes a step-by-step -step instruction to repeat this demo that you just saw. And so you can try this at home and get that pretty graph pinging with one another at home. So that's it. Thank you for hang here and asking questions. Uh, any other questions before we call it a night? Another one, yep. Oh, so I think the first one there is overlay. So one of the things we did to make this scale at Calico is we separated the two basic things you need to do. I need to have reachability. Anything should be able to reach anything else if policy allows it, that's reachability. And the second is I need to be able to apply policy to prevent them. Most of the overlay solutions out there have conflated those two. If you are in VLAN 1, you can talk to other things in VLAN 1. If you're in VLAN 2, you can talk to other things in VLAN 2. So they've conflated the reachability and policy enforcement. First of all, this is now a lot of extra state I'm carrying around. And that state is scaling to whatever the highest amount of scale is for either of those problems. One. Two, that works really well if I'm mainly north-south. Everything's within one application cluster. I never need to talk anything outside that. But now something in one needs to talk to something in two. So now I have to build a firewall rule to stitch VLAN 1 to VLAN 2 together for those addresses for that port. But wait a second, I might get launched in any address within that VLAN, so now I have to open the whole thing up or update the firewall rules each time. So all of a sudden, by doing an overlay that conflates the two, I now need to update all those rules and update all that state whenever I want to make a connection between the two. And there's two ways that isolation is enforced. Are you in the right VLAN? And is there a rule that lets you break out of that VLAN or that tunnel? So when you go to this, an overlay model, that's sort of what you're buying into. Another big issue with overlays 
is when something can't get from A to B, I now have to figure out where it broke, what layer it broke at. You know, was it the IP routing between the two endpoints and the L3 service in between? Or was it the underlying transport for the VXLAN? Or was it the VXLAN state itself? So I now have to go try and figure out which layer in the network broke before I can then figure out how it broke and how to fix it. In this model, how many people here know how to use ping and trace route? You can troubleshoot a Calico network. So the way you troubleshoot a Calico network is ping and trace route because it is an IP routed infrastructure. The same way you troubleshoot your problems at home or you know, today in your office or whatever else is the way you troubleshoot a Calico network. And we'll have better, we'll have more graphical tools for that kind of stuff as well, but basically it's an IP network. It doesn't require lots of additional skills beyond that point. Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct. So Mesos DNS assumes that it owns a, um, a zone or a, a subzone, right? It, it, Mesos is the thing. So IPAM is an updating DNS. Mesos DNS is doing the service discovery. So Mesos DNS is going to do that. And you, you can assign it to be a delegation of your root zone. But DNS is separate from IPAM. And they're related, but they're separate. So DNS, you would delegate a subdomain to Mesos DNS for, for discovery or allow it to use something else entirely. IPAM, this is the more the classical service provider IPAM. Service providers really don't care if this is your TV and this is your laptop and anything else. They assign you a block of addresses. What you do with that is your business. So in this case, in the enterprise IPAM, the folks running the fabric would say, I need a block of addresses. And in that IPAM, you would basically say, OK, this block of addresses is assigned to this fabric. That block of addresses is given to the Calico IPAM, and the Calico IPAM will take care of assigning it and making sure it doesn't get overused and uh, overassigned, etc. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> Um, if you honestly have L2 only workloads, that's one use case. So if I honestly have uh, something that doesn't talk IP, that's uh, one I'd be wondering why you're putting the kind of workload in Mesos. Uh, yes? <laughs> Two, if you have overlapping addresses, if you're allowing people to overlap addresses in your fabric, most cases in cloud native environments, people don't get to pick their addresses. They're assigned by the infrastructure. If you've got a case where people have overlapping addresses, Calico as currently architected would not be able to support that. We actually have an architecture that will support that. Um, and I'm waiting for a customer to tell me they need it. As of yet, I have not said when we can't deploy this without that, but overlapping addresses uh, is one case right now where an overlay might make sense. Um, the other, it's not even a full-blown overlay. Occasionally, like I hinted at earlier, sometimes you do need to tunnel over something because the routers just simply won't talk to you, and so you need to opaque your, your payload packet from those routers. So in those cases, we actually have a stateless IP and IP tunnel that will work, but other overlays might make sense in that case. But as a general rule, that's usually to get over one thing, say between your two clouds and you know, corporate IT doesn't want to listen to our routing, you may have to pop between over those. So as a general rule, especially in this environment, we don't see it as a many cases where an overlay intrinsically makes sense. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
So each node has a block of addresses and flannel, yes. So flannel, well, flannel assigns a block of addresses. Flannel then normally tunnels that anyway. So it's basically a local IPAM assignment is all, um, rather than a routed infrastructure. They usually still tunnel You don't have to, but that's pretty much all cases. It's what they do. Um, but yeah, we're not the only ones who have done an IPAM for cloud environments. You know, it's, we think ours is pretty good, but you know, if you know, Calico is more than just the IPAM. Huh? So, thank you. I forgot that the slide that there was a, another couple of slides back there. Um, Right now, what we what we're restricted and why, what we want to hear from folks or, or want to achieve, right now we only support Marathon. We don't support any of the other frameworks. Some people in this room have talked about uh, developing, helping us develop for other frameworks. Uh, I expect to to hear from them after this meeting, uh, but uh, we'd also be interested in hearing from folks as what other frameworks they would like to see supported by something like Calico. We support uh, the Docker Dean uh, via the same network net modules uh, mechanism. Um, however, right now, the Docker Daemon uses a different networking model using uh, Docker's lib network, which isn't really well integrated with Mesos. So this becomes a little bit of a race. If you're wanting to run the Docker containerizer, it's a bit of an issue right now. Uh, if you're, you know, so option A is wait for universal containerizer, um, which will will be able to use the uh, the regular networking model we've been talking about here. If you really, really want to use the Docker containerizer right now, come and talk to us afterwards. We've got a couple couple of options right now um, because yeah, some people can't wait for the universal containerizer. Uh, that's another wish list. Universal Containerizer actually getting out and deployed that would be useful. Uh, time integration of fine grained policy control. Right now, a lot of the fine grained policy control I was showing in the demo, I can't really represent today in Mesos. It's not in the, the API frameworks. So we'd like to get that more fully integrated into Mesos and Marathon rather than side loaded into our data model uh, via secondary path. Uh, one step and solve via DCOS, uh, something we're waiting on, and uh, support for container network interface model. So Kubernetes folks have done a really nice networking model called CNI. It's also being used by Rocket and other things. It'd be really nice to get the same CNI policy model uh, in Mesos. Uh, that would, it would, the nice thing about that is pretty much then everyone minus one major container vendor or container framework would have, be, have the same networking definition for it, which would make things a little bit easier for everyone. So in summary, routing, you know, IP per container, coupled with policy control for Mesos. We think this is a really potent way of deploying next gener generation applications that are scalable, resilient to attack, and just generally let you get about your business rather than worrying about the network. And we do that with the cat.